dear student colleagues and all the viewers who are watching this program live on facebook page physics at the i would like to welcome you all to my webinar good evening to all hope you are well and safe from corona pandemic today i would like to welcome you all to a joint session between pabna university of science and technology pabna bangladesh and the tata institute of fundamental research tifr mumbai india on a webinar in uh, nuclear physics and fundamental research we have with us here today dr indril mojundar sir professor department of nuclear and atomic physics tifr mumbai india uh, joining with us from mumbai through streamer uh, he has already connected uh, with us i would like to welcome him so good evening sir can good evening. you hear me all of you yes i can hear you okay so welcome to our uh, webinar and welcome to bangladesh through online uh, i think sir this program is going to be a fast collaborating program with any bangladesh university is it sir or you have uh, at least already... for me that is so I, i i do not know about the other departments sir okay but for me it is the first yeah okay sir thank you sir so we are uh, very glad for that uh, you have uh, accepted our proposal we know you are too busy with your research at tfr and i would like to say thank on the behalf of the department of physics from the university of science and technology all you know that we are living in a corona pandemic situation and all the in institution including the universities have shut down uh, uh, since the march 2020 due to corona pandemic so it's very difficult for us to continue uh, academic program and research uh, inside the university due to that we have arranged uh, some online program to continue uh, the academic program and to create an environment for our student uh, so that they can interact with uh, with, with, with teachers and the well known uh, researchers and and we, we know that an interaction between teachers and student is very important for creating a new knowledge and uh, you have already came to know that uh, we have arranged a series of webinar on uh, physics for our student and this is our 15th uh, uh, webinar and in those web near you have already came to know that uh, physicists from different countries are taking part as a main speaker and in that continuity today we have got one of the best nuclear physicists of india uh, dr indrail mojundar sir as a main speaker of our web near and i hope this uh, web near will help our student a lot and it will create an opportunity for our student to interact uh, with uh, such a big uh, nuclear physicist and you know that we have uh, divided uh, our webinar into three parts first i would like to introduce our speaker with our student and the viewers and second uh, there's time uh, where the uh, the speaker can deliver his speak uh, and so the, there is a final session there is a discussion session where uh, anybody can join us uh, and that will be a question and answer session so before going to our today's speaker i would like to introduce our speaker with you all so you have already uh, came to uh, know that the our today's uh, title of our today's webinar is the amazing world of nuclear halos and ifimov effect so today's main speaker is the dr indril mojundar professor department of nuclear and atomic physics tata institute of fundamental research tifr mumbai india and uh, uh, if, if we see his uh, Uh, academic career we can see that uh, he have completed his bachelor and master degree in physics from the university of uh, delhi and after that uh, he completed his phd uh, from uh, jointly from uh, inter university accelerator center formerly known as a nuclear science center new delhi and university of delhi so uh, if we see the fellowship and awards of dr mojumdar we can see that He have a, uh, he, he got a postdoc fellowship uh, at uh, State University of New York at uh, Stony Brook for over three years with Professor uh, Peter Paul. Later, in more recent time, extended a sabbatical at uh, Duke University, Triangle University Nuclear Lab, North Carolina, for more than a year. And if you see the research interest of Dr. Mojinder, you can see that uh, in theoretical field, uh, the theoretical studies of neutron. Uh, rich halo nuclei if you more effect uh, few body dynamics several major first time theoretical prediction book by uh, spinger uh, harlock in press 
experimental work on giant dipole resonance decay studies, uh, fusion and fission studies, quantum uh, viscosity in heavy ion reaction, nuclear level density, etc. And current interest, uh, his current interest in nuclear astrophysics, especially, especially Big Bang nuclear, uh, nucleosynthesis and cosmology. And uh, if we see the, his research grade ID, we can see his research grade number 34.45. And uh, uh, he's a very well-known nuclear physicist in, in India, and we feel proud that he uh, he give us time in our web mail. Sir, uh, I'd, I'd like to welcome you again, sir. Sir, now it's your time. You can start your uh, you. lecture. Okay. Okay. So I share screen. Yeah. Okay, sir. Should come now. Yeah, it's now coming. Yeah. Okay. Maybe you have shared. Uh, your, I don't uh, see it. Uh, you should. You should. You should share the activate activation window, not the all all this. Okay. Uh, let, let, let me just let me just restart it again. I uh, I first go to share screen, right? Yeah, yeah, of course. And, uh, and there is the option in, in the above. Share this moment. Activation window. Yeah. Okay, you should uh, click that. No, that is not coming. It's coming. Okay, you should uh, uh, reopen that file. Yeah. Uh, and then. The file is open. Okay, then just, the file uh, is actually open on the side. Okay, uh, then uh, you see. So I go to all your screen. Yeah. I go to the share screen, and then it says share screen tips and share screen. You should you should you should click the share. Uh, 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 share. Oh yeah 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 I, I understand yeah it should come now. Oh. Slightly different. It should come okay, now. Now now it's done. Yeah. Is it? Uh, yeah, it's, it's now. Uh, um, is it, yeah, yeah, but is it, it full? Uh, is it no, full? Should, I mean, you can see. You should some. Uh, you should uh, slide show option. You is it full now? Not yet, sir. Yes. It should on the ah. slide shop. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm doing it, and uh, okay, there is a uh, option in below. Is it now there? Yeah, it's okay. The is it okay? Yeah, yeah it's okay. Sir. You can okay. Start. So should I start? Yeah, of course you can start. Yeah. Okay, uh, good evening everybody and uh, thank you very much uh, Professor Das and uh, Pratham. It is uh, indeed a great pleasure to get this opportunity to deliver this webinar and I sincerely thank you. And also I extend my warm regards to all the colleagues in your department. Uh, so the talk, uh, the talk that I'm going to deliver today is, as, is titled The Amazing World of Nuclear Hellos and the FMO effect. So basically, uh, I will be talking about some so-called halo nuclei, and uh, these nuclei have exotic structures, and they show very exotic uh, features which are otherwise not seen in so-called normal nuclei. And uh, as the talk progresses, I hope I will be able to convince uh, those of you who are not acquainted with this branch of nuclear physics that the world of halo nuclei is no less esoteric than the world of an artist's imagination, as you see here. So, so the plan of the talk is somewhat like this. I would give an introduction. So I understand from Pritham that I will be also addressing primarily the young students. And uh, some of them may not be well acquainted with, uh, uh, with uh, nuclear physics as such, nuclear structures or such halo nuclei. 
So I will give somewhat elaborate introduction to set the tone. And then I will talk about uh, a simple three body model. Uh, it's primarily a theoretical work, but I will not go into the nitty gritties of the theory. Rather, the whole effort will be to uh, convey the excitement and the, and the physical uh, picture of this, uh, of this uh, branch of nuclear physics. So I will talk about a three body model to understand this kind of two neutron halo nucleus. And as a case study, we will take up the case of 11 lithium. And then in the second part of the talk, I will introduce some very esoteric quantum mechanical effect called the Efimov effect. And we will see that uh, we can search for such Efimov effect in two neutron halo nuclei. And then I will Sorry. change gear and introduce another uh, interesting feature uh, associated with the resonance, which is called the Fano resonance. And I will show how the mechanism of Fano resonance can be connected uh, with the nuclear physics to, to find out the Efimov states in nuclei, and then give examples of some few other candidates. That means basically nuclei, which are uh, uh, which would, which are good candidates uh, for searching uh, for Efimov effect, and then I will summarize. Okay, so, so excuse so, me, sir. Uh, sir yes. Is yeah. not coming, sir. There's some part. Why is it not coming? I don't know, sir. There's some part I've cut down, so it's not. Yes, full screen is okay. not coming. Yeah. Okay. Now it's okay, but when you uh, on the full screen, then oh, see all along you, you cannot see the you can can you see it now? Yeah, now it's okay. I think uh, you can increase the uh, yeah. few percentage. Can, can it, then. What about now? Is it getting yeah, cut? Yeah, now okay. Now okay, sir. Now okay. Is it cut? Okay. So okay. Let, no, let no, me. No, no. Uh, sorry. It's okay, sir. Is it's it okay? okay yeah. Now okay. It's okay. So so this work I am going to talk about. We have been involved in this physics for quite some time now, and the primarily over the years it has been carried out in collaboration with Professor V S Hasin from Delhi University. Uh, Dr. V. Arora from Delhi University, and also some part of the work has been carried out in collaboration with Professor Ravi Rao uh, from Louisiana State University. So now this is a very well established field now, um, uh, and there are many uh, review articles are there, and I have listed some of them, not all of them. And uh, so if you want to study about the subject, you can go into these references, and there are some very recent one also, which I can talk about later. And then primarily in this talk, I will be drawing uh, from our own uh, calculations, which are in these papers. And finally, this year, we are actually bringing out a book by Springer in which we'll have more or less all these things which I'm going to talk about. So let us uh, start with this slide. What you see uh, is basically called the Segre chart or the chart of the nuclides. And uh, the, any uh, uh, studies of nuclear physics, at least low energy, medium energy nuclear physics, where we talk about nuclear structure or nuclear reactions, etc., actually begins and ends on this plot itself. What you basically see that all the nuclides in the universe that one can think of, or which actually uh, can exist, are actually plotted on this on this uh, thing. So along the uh, this axis, x axis, you have the neutron number, and on the y axis, you have the proton numbers. So, for any given new nucleus or nuclide, for a given neutron and proton number, that is put here as a point. And you can imagine this whole plot in a three dimensional, where you can add in another uh, z axis on it, which can depict the total energy of the system. So, that means the system will be at a ground state where the energy is minimized, and then you can basically have a kind of a valley the potential energy landscape. So all these black dots are the so-called stable nucleides, and there are around 300 or so, and uh, like oxygen 16, lead 208, sulfur 32, like that, okay? So these are those nuclei. And as you move up, you are, for a given neutron number, you are increasing the number of protons, or as you go down, you are reaching towards this line where for a given proton number, you are increasing the number of neutrons. So that means in this entire landscape, you can possibly have something like 7,000 nuclides. Now, theoretically, it is still almost very, very difficult to predict the exact number of uh, nuclides that can exist, but roughly you can say there are some 7,000 of them. And so nuclear physicists, depending upon their tests, they, they probe any particular region on this chart. So as you move away, go towards this line, 
which is called the proton drip line. That means beyond this number, the nucleus for a given number of neutrons cannot accommodate any more proton. The binding energy of the last proton will be zero and separation energy, it will just drip off. Exactly by the same token, if I come down, then it cannot take any more neutrons. Okay, so, and uh, this part is the so-called terra incognita that these nuclei have still not been uh, uh, produced. So as you can say, these are the stable nuclides. All other nuclei are unstable. They have a certain lifetime. So uh, we produce them in the laboratory. And uh, then before they decay out, we try to study their properties. OK, so this is basically the so-called nuclear chart. And now, over this last, if you consider the discovery of neutron in 1932, we are already more than eight decades. Over these decades, we have learned a lot. And these are some of the enduring features of nuclear physics. And they are one is like this particular can you see the screen now fully hello it's okay, okay it's okay sir. Yeah, let, let me know if you cannot if there is any problem okay. so now okay. you actually see this particular ansatz which is basically r which is the radius of any nucleus is given in terms of its mass number a to the power one third multiplied by some number constant r not roughly around you can take it as 1.15 or 1.2 fermi something like that so that means this tells you that as the size of the nucleus increases, its radius also increases. Then also the nucleons, they're all interacting and then they create a mean field. And in that mean field, we produce single particles, this nuclear levels, which is what we get from the shell model picture. And then we also get magic numbers. Okay, so these are all very enduring feature of nuclear structure physics. You have a look at this side, right side of the screen. You have six lithium, seven lithium, all stable, eight lithium, nine lithium, and their size probably increasing because the mass is increasing. And then what happens if you come to 11 lithium? Well, you will know about it very shortly. And what about 10 lithium? 10 lithium does not exist, but whereas all these lithium isotopes do exist. And here you look at lead 208, which has 82 protons and 126 neutron. And you see it's a very large number. And if you want to find its uh, radius, you can apply this formula and you will more or less get exactly that number. So what about lithium 11? To understand that, we have to go back something like 35 years and a pioneering experiment which was carried out by Japanese uh, physicist Isao Tanihata. And that happened with the advent of radioactive ion beam. So just to tell you something that when in nuclear physics we are doing measurements, we actually have a target, which is a stable nucleus and we are shooting a beam on it, a projectile, which is also a stable nucleus, which is accelerated in some accelerator. However, with a stable beam and stable uh, target combinations, you cannot produce all these nuclides I showed you on the chart that was around 7,000 or so. So you have to do something different. So here it is in 1985, what Tanhyata did, these measurements were carried out at the Bevelac facility in Lawrence uh, Barclay Laboratory. So what you are seeing here that they actually have produced 11 boron and 20 neon beams at very high energy, 790 MeV per nucleon. And then they, when they are bombarding these beams on beryllium, carbon, aluminum, etc., like targets, they were producing these nuclei are getting fragmented and you produce nucleus like six lithium, seven lithium, eight lithium, nine lithium, 11 lithium like that, or seven, nine, 10 beryllium like that. And these are the so-called, these nuclei are now produced but they are unstable, they have a certain lifetime. So you filter them out and then you accelerate them and then they become secondary beam and you bombard them on another target and carry out the measurements. The measurements are kind of, if you understand the basic principle is very simple. The main beam is coming, it is falling on a target and interacting. If it doesn't interact, it moves out of it. And so if it interacts, it's slightly the beam gets depleted from the initial flux. So if you have this ratio, that the depleted flux intensity and the initial in intensity can be connected with this kind of answer or formula where this sigma is basically the total interaction cross-section. And now the total interaction cross-section can be written in terms of the interaction radius of the projectile and the target. So from this, you can measure the uh, radius. So actually, if your, your target is of course a stable target, and if the beam is also stable, then if you, uh, extract the radius from these uh, measurements, you will find that the radius exactly follows that r equal to r naught a to the power one third ansatz. However, the most interesting thing that happened was that when you look at uh, 
the radius of, let us say, some uh, unstable nucleides like lithium-11 or 14 beryllium, then lo and behold, you see this amazing thing. This plot shows the mass number on the x-axis and on the y-axis, the interaction radius. And you see that most of the stable nucleides, their radius is falling on this line. That follows the R equal to R not A to the power one third formula. But you see some of these interaction radius like lithium-11 and 14 beryllium is very, very high up. Now, this is very interesting result, but one can say that there is nothing very astounding about it because uh, uh, maybe they are highly deformed. However, many pioneering experiments followed Tanihata's experiment, like one particular experiment by Blank and collaborators, where they're comparing the charge exchange reaction with the cross total cross section. So in the charge exchange for cross sections, almost for eight lithium, nine lithium, and 11 lithium are almost same, whereas the interaction cross section, just like here, just shoots up. Similarly, people in the CERN, I saw that they measured the quadruple moments. They found that the quadruple moment, which basically tells you the deviation from the sphericity, so the lithium 11 and the nine lithium are more or less same, okay? So if you put all these things together, then the obvious uh, conclusion that uh, emerges is that this has a certain structure in which the lithium 11, the nine lithium is a compact core, which is a so-called core, and outside it, you basically have two neutrons, which forms a halo. So they are something like this. So the six lithium to seven, eight, nine lithium, and this is basically what is the most accepted uh, uh, structure of the lithium 11. You have the compact nine lithium core, and you have these two neutron, which forms almost like a halo. And now look at it. This size is almost, almost like that of lead 208. So this is, this discovery of the structure of lithium 11 is an epochal discovery that ushered in a new era of nuclear physics. Now we'll see it is not only, already this structure is pretty esoteric, but not only that this, just this structure, there are associated with it are many, many new features uh, which are contrary to our established knowledge of nuclear physics. So let me go through that. The term hello was actually coined by Gregor Hansen and Bjorn Johnson way back in 1987 in one of the earliest theoretical papers on the structure of lithium-11. So now I will show you the examples of many other uh, hello nuclei. But before that, let me summarize because it was some kind of an historical perspective I have given. But let us on this uh, uh, page summarize all the important uh, features of the hello nuclei. So the striking features are usually they have a very, very small separation energy. This is unusually small. And I will show you what. Like, for example, neutron uh, lithium-11, there are two neutrons outside. So I will talk about two neutron separation energy. If you talk of beryllium-11, then I will talk of which has a one neutron hello. Outside the compact core, there is one neutron. I will talk about the one neutron separation energy. They're basically very, very small compared to what you expect in a, a stable nucleus. They, are, they have a very large matter radius and you can connect this to very easily because if the bind separation energy is very, very small, it actually moves tunnels out of the, of the potential, goes outside the range of the potential and has a very large matter radius. When you break up this such nuclei as a secondary beam on a target, then they also show momentum distributions, which is also understandable because since their spatial extension is large, so by Heisenberg uncertainty principle, they will show a narrow momentum distributions because you break them up at a very high relativistic energy on a target. So what happens that the momentum distributions of the fragments more or less reflect the momentum distributions of these fragments inside the compact uh, uh, nucleus. And then they also show some very interesting property called a Borromean property. I will come to that. So what are the conditions for such halo formation? It has to have a small binding energy so that it can tunnel out. There's also small orbital angular momentum because otherwise centrifugal barrier will stop this formation of the halo. And just like neutron halo, there can also be proton halo, but because of the Coulomb barrier, proton halos are less spectacular or less pronounced than neutron halo. Now just have a look at some numbers. Beryllium 11, as I saw, as I show here, one neutron halo is around 504 kV or so, right? 19 carbon, is so one neutron halo, has one neutron separation energy is like 160 kV. Two neutron halo examples, like six helium, you have an alpha particle, outside there are two neutrons, you have 11 lithium, 
these are all very very small numbers right in comparison i mean if i talk about the lithium 11 most accepted uh, established number as of today two neutron separation energy is like 370 kv but if you talk about the 18 oxygen the two neutron separation energy is like 12.2 mp so that puts things in perspective these numbers are very very small also i talked about momentum distribution there are many experimental plots here just concentrate on this that if you break up 11 lithium and look for this uh, the momentum distribution you see this very narrow component on on top of this on top of this big uh, broad component and that tells you that the momentum distribution is actually this fwh is very small and uh, this also tells you if you put this uh, I, 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 I also um, with, with the other fact that the uh, breakup of neutron breakup or the fragmentation cross sections are very high that means their binding energies are very small if you put all this together you can actually you will arrive that there is a hello structure so momentum measurements momentum distribution is also extremely paramount important in in, in such studies of uh, uh, hello nuclei okay so now I come to another extremely exotic property of this nuclear. This is basically artist impression of lithium-11. But now look at it. Nine lithium is very compact and stable. But if you talk about 10 lithium, it really doesn't exist. It is not stable. And if you talk of two neutrons, then dineutron is also not stable. But if you put all the three together, then they are stable. This is exactly like these three rings. This is kind of a geometric property. If you take any of the, th this, this is a bound system of three rings, nothing's falling apart. But if you take out one of the rings, the other two will fall apart. So this is the property and this symbol, this is a symbol of the heraldic symbol of some royal family somewhere in Italy of the Borromeo family. That's why this is called the Borromean rings. And that is also the reason why such two neutron helonuclei where the binary subsystems are unbound is called Borromean nucleus. Dimetron is unbound and 10 lithium is also unbound. And you will see there are many other examples like this. So this is also a very interesting feature of such nucleus. So what happens, I have so far talked about only one neutron halo where I have a core and one neutron outside, or I can have core and two neutrons outside. But what happens for multi neutrons outside the core? So those neutrons, if there are many neutrons, that because of nuclear forces, they eventually try to form a skin outside that uh, the, the, the core and their uh, extension or um, matter distribution spatial extension is less pronounced. They appear like some sort of a skin. So here I have taken some uh, nice uh, plots from uh, one of these reviews and you can see the four helium, which is your well-known alpha particle, a very compact object, two protons, two neutrons. You put two neutrons, six helium, it's a two neutron halo nucleus. You put four, two more neutrons, it's like a skin of four neutrons outside the compact core. Of course, theoretically, you can also deal with it as a five body system as a compact core and four neutrons. Now, the difference in them and, and the two neutron separation energy for again six helium is pretty small actually, 970 kV or so. And another picture plot I will show you about the, the, their, their, the, the distribution of the mass. As you can see, this is for a, a regular stable nucleus for 11 lithium, this portion is basically the halo part goes on and on and on like that. Whereas for a skin like uh, eight helium, probably here the one below, it just comes down. Okay, and this is for six helium. So these are experimentally uh, measured and theoretically analyzed data. And so that more or less tells you all the important features. As for the skin is concerned, this is also very interesting these days because people talk about pygmy dipole resonance, which is basically some kind of vibration of the core inside this shell of the skin. So this is also something very interesting. So now, so far I talked about the structure. So, so far at the, people are always interested in understanding the structure, this very esoteric structure of this nuclear, uh, this, this hello nuclei. But you have to understand that you, their structure and reactions are all interconnected. You cannot understand the structure without doing the reactions because you have to bombard the hello nuclei on a stable target. So, so people have been those who are in nuclear physics is basically low, medium energy nuclear physics can be divided into three parts. The, those who are interested all in the structure, on the structure, shapes, evolution of the shape, etc., And those who are interested in the reaction, two nuclei reacting at different energies and the aftermath of that. Or people are interested directly into the interactions, just taking a very few body, very light nucleus 
and just try to understand the nuclear nuclear interaction between them. But they're all connected, obviously. So those who have been all these years, uh, even before the advent of radioactive ion beam, were doing nuclear uh, reaction studies, are also continuing their nuclear reaction studies. But instead of stable beam, they are doing, uh, they are using uh, this halo nuclei or the very loosely bound nuclei. And so people do a lot of measurements, fusion reactions with loosely bound nuclei, elastic, inelastic scattering reactions, etc. Breakup of the reactions. And so this is a very, very uh, active field of research, whether from people are looking at it at from the structure or looking at from the reaction point of view. In this talk, I'll be primarily just talking, concentrating only on the structure. And uh, now uh, one must uh, spend some time about the experimental facilities. So this is the plot that I have taken from this reference. So basically radioactive ion beam facility, uh, are there are basically two types. As I said, how to produce the, the, the radioactive ion beam. So you have initially a beam. So either it can be what is called the isol or isotope separate online, or which is uh, target fragmentation, or you can have projectile fragmentation. In case of target fragmentation, you have a very, let us say a very light beam, like proton of several hundreds of MeV, and you bombard it on a target, as a thick target, and it multi-fragments. And these, those fragments are, they diffuse out of the target, okay? And then they are accelerated further, and then you produce a secondary beam. So it's a very complicated thing, but in, this is basically what I said is the gist of the thing, something like that. Or you can have in-flight projectile fragmentation when you have a very, very high energy heavy ion, which falls on a thin target, and then again, it gets fragmented, and it continues to move more or less with the same speed, and then this is the projectile fragmentation. And there are major experimental facilities in the world in which uh, either you use ISOL or in-flight uh, mechanism by which you produce radioactive ion beams and do measurements. And uh, there are some major facilities which are also under construction and will be operational or uh, commissioned in near future. And this plot shows actually summarizing this, that as I said, the major facilities, in-flight or ISOL facilities, or there are also very smaller facilities which can also produce radioactive ion beam and can nicely complement all this work in these uh, bigger, massive uh, 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 facilities. And these are smaller facilities, but they're also extremely, extremely productive and useful. And this is uh, some of the uh, examples of the future facilities which are under construction and they're coming up. So that more or less, okay, you can have other mechanisms also. You can shoot neutrons, either thermal neutrons or, 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 or fast neutrons, and you, uh, that leads to fission of a heavy system and then the fission fragments will also will be they will be unstable and one can study them or you can carry out uh, uh, gamma induced uh, fission of uh, of uh, heavy nuclei and then again in the fission fragments you can get nuclei of your choice which you want to study so this is basically in nutshell this whole experimental scenario where you study this nuclei and let us have a look at some of these nuclei which are hello so the two neutron halo, like the most, the poster boy of this uh, two neutron halo nuclei is definitely lithium-11. Then you also have 14 beryllium, you have 12 beryllium, six helium, 17 boron, like that. You also have about 20 carbon, 22 carbon, et cetera, which are definitely two neutron halo nucleus. See, a nucleus can be near the drip line, but not necessarily it has to be always a halo, but these nuclei are definitely established two neutron halo nuclei. Similarly, the one neutron halo, like 19 carbon, by one neutron again, I repeat that the 18 carbon compact core outside there one neutron. Similarly, you can have 11 beryllium. And also you can have on the proto drip line side, you can have proton halo nuclei, like eight boron, 17 neon, 17 fluorine, etc. Okay, and the search is on, people are uh, discovering newer and newer. Now it is not only this uh, nuclei on the drip line, but even beyond the drip line, there will be resonances. So really very, very esoteric thing. So just one example I cite just from less than a year ago, last year's, people talked about 11 oxygen, which is basically the mirror of the 11 lithium. But of course it's a resonance, but they produced it and one can study and get a lot of information about things. So you can see 11 lithium, uh, sorry, 11, 11 oxygen, and then you have this 11, uh, 11 lithium and 11 oxygen as the mirror of each other. So this you can uh, check into it. Now let me just quickly tell you about how we study all these nuclei as for theoretically. So it is basically, it has to be a model calculations. There are different types and uh, I will talk about only one, but 
I just uh, mentioned the other techniques. Like for example, one of the earliest techniques by Hansen and Johnson, a uh, neurophysics later, in which they model the whole nucleus like lithium-11, like as a nine lithium compact core. And outside there's a system of dineutron. Okay, that was one kind of calculations. Similarly, one can talk about what is called uh, cluster orbi orbital shell model uh, uh, approximation like that. You can actually use full-fledged shell model calculations or large scale shell model calculations, quantum Monte Carlo calculations, et cetera, et cetera. These days people talk about effective field theory, okay, relativistic mean field model. I will talk about a very simple three-body model, but the whole idea is basically to, you will see even it's a simple model, you can actually more or less reproduce all, all the structural features of this nuclei and can also study many other esoteric effects. Okay, so I will quickly go, go to this, but before I go into it, I just, I am tempted to show one slide where you see one of the uh, living legends of nuclear structure physics, Professor Igal Talmi. And uh, since we are talking about a very new branch of nuclear physics and more modern theoretical techniques and all that, but you see 11 beryllium is actually a hello nucleus and one neutron hello. And Professor Talmi way back 60 years ago exactly, actually did the calculations for 11 beryllium and got its spin parity ground state and also the, 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 the binding energy of the neutron and all that. And in, in a personal chat, he actually jokingly said that uh, we were uh, smart enough to do the calculations and study this uh, nucleus, but we're not smart enough to find a new term and call it a one neutron hello nucleus. Okay, so now since I showed two plots quickly, you know, uh, because I will be talking about three body model, so three body problem is a very interesting problem, of course, in physics, whether in classical physics or quantum physics and all that. And in quantum mechanism, the three body problem was, has always been a very treacherous, very difficult problem. And great names were always involved in solving this. Let us say uh, three body, let us say three body uh, 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 scattering or the three body Lipman-Schwinger equation, how to tackle them and all that. Ludwig Fadeb, Steven Weinberg, Claude Lovelace, and all these people, and also Professor Ian Mitra, who is still active from Dell University, and he were also, they are all working in this, and uh, to, to tackle a three-body problem, three-body scattering. Here you see Professor Ian Mitra delivering a lecture, and uh, exactly 10 years ago at TIFR, and in the same meeting, you see Professor Ludwig Fadeb, one of the giants of the giants also delivering a lecture on, on, on a meeting that you organized called nuclear nuclear interaction and nuclear many body problem exactly 10 years ago at TIFR. So I will now quickly tell you something about this three body model. So the model is something like that. The nucleus 11 lithium, you keep that in mind, is being considered as a three body system in which you have a compact core, that is the nine lithium. And you have these two neutrons outside and you have these two neutrons outside and it forms a three body uh, system, okay? And uh, uh, so the three body system is bound and the binary subsystems, the dineutrons or the neutron and the core, they are interacting via uh, uh, an interaction and the interaction is taken in the A state interaction, okay, L equal to zero. And this is taken in some kind of a separable form, okay? And uh, you write down the Schrodinger equations, you work in momentum space, and this is the potentials between these binary subsystems. And where the important parameter is basically the strength parameter lambda, which is the strength parameter for the interaction, and also the beta, which is the range parameters. So for any, so you have these binary systems, they're interacting, neutron, neutron, and neutron and core. For any given binding energy for these binary systems, the lambda and beta are so chosen, they are parameters, not that all the time you know about them because the interaction is not exactly known. So these lambda and beta, these parameters are so chosen so as to reproduce the things in that scattering length and effective range for that binary system. Anyway, so the system is that this is the three body wave function. And uh, this is some of the most basic things I'm telling you. We need not go into the details in this talk. This is the three body wave functions for the system in which you can see these three parts and where this capital FP and capital GP, et cetera, these are the wave functions for the, uh, for the core which is the spectator function for the core when the other two neutrons are interacting, okay? Or the spectator functions of the neutron when the other two particles are interacting. And these spectator functions are, multi are, are, are multiplied from this side, from the left, by these correlation functions of the other two particles. Anyway, so these three body wave functions and these spectator functions, they satisfy this kind of integral, coupled integral equations when you simplify the whole thing, then it all boils down to a single integral equation in one variable, 
which can be solved as an eigenvalue problem. And from that one can actually get the binding energies and other properties. So I will just uh, fast forward and not go into the details of this. These are the kernels of these integral equations, etc. But you need not go into these details right this moment. Let us look at the results of it. As I said, the important parameters are that, that there are this strength parameter between the two neutrons and the, and and uh, the, their range parameters, which is uh, which is known. So, which is known. And uh, so, neutron-neutron interaction. This is known to us. But the important thing to 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 worry about is the neutron and the core interaction, because for ten lithium, this interaction is not very well known. And so, during our early days, these are very early calculations, one of the earliest theoretical calculations. Uh, we consider a virtual state of 800 kV for the N lithium. So similarly, if you have six helium, you should worry about the neutron-neutron interaction and the neutron and the alpha interaction, etc. If something is known in the literature, you accordingly use, you, 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 you freeze your uh, strength and range parameters from that kind of interaction. Okay, so uh, now basically to coming to the physics, what do you want to study? You want to study the structural properties, the geometric properties. So like the two neutron separation energy, Okay, that is very important. If I sell 11 lithium, two neutron separation energy is 370 kV or so, one should be able to uh, derive, uh, extract it from the theoretical calculations. One should be able to reproduce the momentum distributions of the fragments. One should be able to get the root mean square radius. And one should also be able to know uh, or, or study even more interesting properties like beta decay. In this talk, I will not touch upon the beta decay, though we have done a lot of work on this beta decay of lithium 11. It's a very complicated problem, very interesting problem. But I will just give some examples of this, uh, I mean, this, this, uh, I will talk about only these uh, properties uh, from our calculations and uh, like this. So if you do these calculations, you solve this, that, that integral equation I talked about as an eigenvalue problem, and uh, you actually derive that binding energies, and we could get the binding energies more or less in the same ballpark uh, as what is known now experimentally. And then we also could produce the momentum distributions because a fragmentation this 11 lithium is getting fragmented there were experimental data available those days and uh, you can actually produce the momentum distributions you can also get the correlation functions because these are coincidence measurements when the 11 lithium is broken into two parts you measure uh, you detect them in coincidence you can get the correlation functions between the neutron neutrons or the neutron and the core and then we could actually produce them when you know the correlation functions you can go back and uh, actually calculate the root mean square matter radius, which we found that time around 3.6 Fermi. And the more uh, accepted value these days is probably 3.2 Fermi or something like that. Okay, so this is how you get these uh, structural properties. And uh, here I must uh, quickly mention that this correlation of these two neutrons is extremely important because, you know, dineutron is not stable, doesn't exist as such. But inside the nucleus, it is stable. And so people actually talk about these dineutrons uh, and they study a lot. And these dineutron properties are also probably different in different nuclei. Lithium-11, 6 helium, uh, grossly appear exactly same, two neutron halo nucleus. But if you actually do the calculations, you may find that the, from the correlations that the 11 lithium and 6 helium are actually quite different. So these are much more complicated things are there in it. I'm not going it, but this is a very important feature. And when you, this way from 6 helium, you go to 8 helium, you can talk about two dineutrons. So one can talk about dineutron dineutron correlations and things like that. So this is a very, very exciting field of research. So similarly, these calculations, like a very recent paper by Artemis Spiro, where they're from 16 beryllium, they're looking for the decay of dineutrons, as if the dineutron is coming out from that system. OK, so they, I, I hope I have given you some feeling about the, the structure of this halo nuclei and uh, the kind of the structural properties that one tries to study either uh, in experiments or through some simple-minded uh, calculations. At this stage, I would just change the gear and introduce the second character in this uh, uh, talk, and that of uh, Mr. Vitaly Efimov. And uh, Efimov uh, found out theoretically as a graduate student way back in 1970 in, 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 uh, in Moscow in Russia, about a very, very interesting, cute quantum mechanical feature, which is called the Efimov effect. And I will tell you what is Efimov effect, and I will connect it that with nuclear physics now with the halonucleus. 
So let us look at this FEMO effect. FEMO effect is some effect and uh, about a three body system. Well, here again, you see Vitaly FEMO in the same meeting in 2010 at TIFR and lecturing in our lecture theater. And uh, here is around the, on the west lawn of TIFR, Professor Fadev and the FEMO and Mrs. FEMO and another giant of uh, nuclear physics or few body physics, uh, Belayev. And uh, so, FEMOV effect is a three body uh, effect in quantum mechanical effect in, in which you imagine a three body system like lithium 11, you can imagine, or just three alpha particles, whatever, three bosons. And um, uh, that's what was FEMOV's original calculations, three particles in which their binary subsystems are resonating or they are just bound, zero energy bound. And now if you, in, if you think about the binary interaction strength as lambda, and if that lambda, if you keep changing the value of the lambda as you increase the strength of the lambda, what happens, the three body system, initially the three particles are separate. Now you are increasing the binary interactions, they come closer and then they just bound. As it happens, as the value of the lambda or the strength of the binary interaction corresponding to which it has a certain scattering length, as it keeps increasing, then what happens, the three body bound state starts appearing. Very weakly bound, the system becomes bound. And almost when you come to a point where the scattering length is almost infinitely large for that given binary interaction, or it is just zero energy bound, then the number of bound states is almost infinity. Now you keep increasing the strength of this binary interaction further, and then some very interesting things happen. You increase the strength, but the number of bound states starts disappearing, or in other words, they go into the continuum, and the number of states starts disappearing, and then they slowly, slowly start disappearing. If a, 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 you can see this uh, picture, that is at a certain value of the scattering length corresponding to this, uh, this binary uh, interaction of this binary system, the scattering length, at a certain value, the system is bound, very weakly bound. It is very fragile, but it is bound, three body system. But as you start increasing the strength between these binary pairs, it, what happens that one of it just goes out. I can just draw an example or an analogy from, uh, uh, from our life. You have three friends who are there. Earlier, no, they do not know each other, but they come closer. And then all of a sudden out of this ABC, two of them become closer friends and one becomes suspected. And this is exactly what you see here in this quantum mechanical world. So this is the feature. And here are some of the most important uh, properties of such an, this effect. The particle exchange any number of time between any two particles lead to an effective three body interaction of one by R square. This is very universal in nature, okay? And the form of the long range attraction does not depend upon the shape of the interparticle force. And I said the number of states actually become infinity. Actually, there's a logarithmic dependence, which is given by some of this formula, which is derived by FEMO along that. That is the scattering length modulus divided by the range of the interaction. Now remember the range of the interaction is small and the scattering length is much, much larger than the range of the interaction. So this is basically large uh, scattering length physics, okay? And this is a get number of states and the size of the state, it's physically it swells up. So as you go to the next FM of state, the size is even bigger like that. And there is some kind of scaling law, which is there. Adjacent energy levels, they follow the, the scaling behavior. So basically the necessary conditions are, this is a low energy requirement and it's there is a large scattering length. This is a physics of large scattering length, okay? Now, interestingly, if you look in your quantum mechanics book, so what I'm talking about, I'm talking about something which is like a threshold phenomena, which is like a limiting case where the scattering length is tending to infinity. And for that value, I have a three body bound system which has infinite number of states coming. I'll not go uh, present it in that mathematical term exactly, but just think physically, this is a scattering length going to infinity and you have this infinite number of states coming. Exactly other side of the coin is the so-called Thomas effect, which was theoretically predicted way back, exactly 35 years before FEMOV's theory. And that says if you have a three body system in which the range of the interaction is going to zero, zero range interaction, okay? then the system collapses. Or in other words, you get infinite number of states, but which are infinitely bound. So the its system collapses, okay? So basically these are the two sides of the same coin. So this is one very nice picture, which actually tells you 
the physics of FM of FF. If you think about this region, that's, I have the energy scale, y-axis, and I have one upon a, the scattering length. So if the scattering length is infinity, I am here, okay? So you are, you are above the three-body threshold. That is where all the three particles are separate. They're not bound. But now you bind the two particles. It is like this. And the other particle is just as a spectator, like a quasi-bound system. And in this region, that means for a given value of energy and scattering length, you can have a bound system of the trimer or the three-body system. You can see this. So as I change the value of the scattering length more and more and more, and you are going towards this part, in this part, you see the states are coming closer and closer, and there will be very many. And as I start increasing the binary interaction, at one point, the trimer breaks up into a bound binary and a spectator third particle. So this line is the demarcation line. It tells you this is the three-body bound area, and in this part, you are actually in the above the two-body breakup threshold. And as you go in this part, you are above the three-body breakup threshold. All particles are separate. So this is the most beautiful physical representation of this whole physics of the FEMO effect. Now, you can ask whether there will be FEMO effect in four-body system. So accordingly, you can have a similar picture for the four-body system. So now, I will say that uh, this was immediately after the, on the hill of this discovery of 1970 by FEMOV, people started working and uh, different techniques were used. Uh, for their techniques, they said there was Amaru and Julian Noble. They did a lot of work, Fonseca, Southern Adhikari in Brazil and Fonseca and many other people started working. This is a primarily theoretical work and uh, people were experimentally also trying to find out such uh, FEMOV states, three body systems. Primarily, those were efforts made by atomic molecular physicists because the energy scale is so small that in nuclear physics, this went more or less uh, unnoticed. Only few body community and people like this I show here or in Delhi University, uh, Vasi, Professor Vasin, or these uh, people in Brazil or this Amato and Noble or in US. And the, these people worked on it or people somewhere in Germany, the few body community or atomic molecular physics. But in nuclear physics, this was the subject more or less tapered off and they remained of academic interest. However, it was in 1970 when the FMOZ paper came, and only in 2006, there was first experimental signature of an FMOZ state in an atomic system, cold atom experiments, where people take, let us say, cesium gas, they cool an ensemble of uh, atoms, okay? And then uh, there they found the signatures. How do you find it? You, you cool it, either you form a Bose-Einstein condensate, okay? in a trap and then as the system of many atoms they cool and then what happens there will be formation of dimers there will be formation of trimers and that is clusterization that means from that whole many body system these clusters three body clusters will just go out so it will be depletion in the number of the atoms and then you can see this recombination rate at a given scattering length which is controlled by controlling the magnetic fields it just shoots up and like in this plot this is the fm of region Okay, so you are forming these FMOV states of this uh, in these trimers and then move out of the main system. So in a very complicated way, people can find out from these measurements that FMOV states were there. But the point is, so I will go a little fast at this stage. So this was in 2006. And then again in 2009, even better measurements were carried out and people find in 39 potassium also the signature of FMOV states. This is all in atomic physics, cold atom measurements and you actually get a very large scattering length by tuning the magnetic field, and uh, which is possible. But the problem is, can we find the FMO effect in atomic nucleus? Unlike cold atom experiments, we have no control over the scattering length in a nucleus, like let us say lithium-11, whatever with the scattering length for that given dineutron or the neutron-9 lithium system, that I cannot control. So we have to really search for a nucleus in which the conditions will be favorable to look for an FMO state. First of all, it has to be a kind of a three-body nucleus uh, that can be modeled as a three-body system, and the binary interaction should be such that it should be vulnerable to to to, uh, to this FMO effect. So let us see. So the discovery of two neutron halo nucleus uh, characterized by very low separation energy and large spatial extensions are ideally suited for studying FMO effect in atomic nucleus. So those nuclei like lithium-11, which we were studying all along, purely from nuclear physics point of view, their peculiar structure point of view. Now they also appear to be good candidates 
to look for a few more better. So now I will just really uh, skip this uh, uh, theoretical parts. Let us say that we extend our calculations and uh, we try to search for such a few more states. And the first nucleus that we want to search for is, uh, let us say, 14 beryllium. Now, 14 beryllium is definitely a two neutron hello nucleus. You can imagine a 12 beryllium core and two neutrons. Now, the, let us look at it interest. This is the very interesting thing. As I said, in these whole calculations, it is just one single parameter. And that parameter is the interaction strength of the neutron and the core. That is 12 beryllium and neutron, so 13 beryllium. Okay, and now, so that is the only parameter and uh, which is varied. So on this plot, like you say, this, this energy corresponding to this, uh, uh, this 13, in the 13 beryllium, beryllium system. Now 13 beryllium is definitely unbound. So we are talking of virtual states, okay? So the correspondingly negative scattering length. So as you consider is, let us say 50 kV as the binding energy state for the, for the 13 beryllium system, we can reproduce for the 14 beryllium its ground state. This is the exact energy of the two neutron separation energy of 1350 kV. However, there is no signature of any excited states. These columns are for excited states. First, we have to get some excited states, and then we have to put many diagnostics to find out whether they qualify to be the FEM of states. However, as you keep decreasing this value, or in other words, keep increasing the scattering length, and you see these are very large values for any in nuclear physics, we really do not talk about this kind of very large scattering lens. So as you do that, you start seeing signatures of new states coming up, very weakly bound, but they are there, okay? So, and this is exactly what is shown here in this plot. You see two different states. One is the ground state, then the first excited state and the second excited state. So on this plot, I am plotting the second excited state here, and I am plotting the first excited state here, okay? So as the scattering length is changing, either from positive side or negative side. And I mean, here in this plot, I show basically the negative values. If you go, you move towards very large scattering length. You see the logarithmic value of the scattering length. You move towards the FMOV region where you can get a particular state like this on this column. Similarly, then you can get a second excited state, which is basically this. And this whole plot, if you see the scale, will actually come here. Similarly, you may expect a third FMOV state like that, okay? But you are getting it only when your scattering lengths are extremely large and the system is very, very, very weakly bound. This it, it, is just the two body system. So similarly, then you look for another. So there were other experimental measurements where they discussed about our work of Thurton beryllium. Uh, they, they, they talked about an intruder state in this Thurton beryllium. And then we can also talk about other nuclei. Let's say 19 boron, which is also a, a, a two neutron, uh, a boromian nucleus. 22 carbon, which is also boromium. That means 21 carbon is unbound. 18 boron is also unbound. And here you see exactly the same features. You can reproduce uh, the ground state energy, but you cannot reproduce the any, do not get signature of any excited states. But as you keep decreasing this value, the two body binding energy, and keep increasing the scattering length very large, you start getting it. This was understood by us analytically why this is happening. And we understood that so long the scattering lengths are negative or for or virtual states in the two body binary systems, there is hardly any possibility of getting into the FMO region, which is uh, okay, or, or to blow up this two body uh, this propagators. But anyway, uh, so, but then if it is a non Borromean system, okay, and uh, that means if the two body binary systems are slightly bound, then there is every possibility that we can get a signature of FMO state. Now, then we have to search for such a nucleus. So one such nucleus is 20 carbon, and that is actually non-Boromian. And that means 19 carbon is a bound nucleus, okay? And lo and behold, if you do the calculations, you see that as you change this 19 carbon binding energies, and as you change accordingly the scattering length, this is a bound system now, you actually produce the ground state energy, and also you start producing the ex signature of excited states like this, okay? So that is quite interesting. So, and here I actually basically show this. The interesting part is that if you, if you can get all these excited states, but one has to remember that uh, these excited states are some of them are actually superfluous solutions of the three-body equations. 
because if you plot them on such a plot that is this is the two body binding energy versus three body energy minus the two body that the relative thing you can see this is the first excited state which is there which is the bound excited state but beyond a certain value of the two body interaction this state actually goes here in below this li line that means now the two body energy is actually more than the three body energy which physically it means that it has gone above the breakup threshold you will no longer see it as a bound fm of state similarly as you keep increasing the two body strength the second state also disappears into the continuum and that means initially you get these excited fm of states which are bound but after some time those states actually move into the continuum which i have bracketed here so now you cannot trust these states because you are doing a bound state calculations and these are actually into the scattering setting so all these things so anyway so uh, uh, we, i talked about 19 boron also and we talked about some uh, intruder states in the 18 borons which should be there if there has to be a few more states in 19 boron and that was also experimentally this was discussed in this paper in michigan state university but let me come back to the to the uh, 20 carbon case where whatever the features i told you that we get signatures of a few of states but only when it is non boromian i see i can trust those states and then as i keep increasing the two body interaction those states move into the continuum and uh, then what happens to these bound states okay so this whole feature is basically because of a subtle interplay between the three body and the two body uh, energies or it is basically the effect of a singularity so we want to study this singularity in the scattering sector because you can imagine what I'm trying to say, 20 carbon nucleus, I see some bound excited states, but you start increasing the binary interaction of the 19 carbon. Then exactly remember that picture that it will become like 19 carbon and one neutron as a spectator. So you are now in a scattering sector as if a zero energy neutron or very low energy neutron is being shot on the 19 carbon. So basically you have to do a scattering calculation now and you have to cal calculate the scattering amplitudes uh, for let us say neutron on 19 carbon for for different binding energies of the 19 carbon system okay so so this is the picture so basically if you are you just once again look at this plot this is what i was showing for different two body binding energies i get the ground state energy correct and then i see signature of excited states which we identify as FM of states using different diagnostics. But for a given value of this two body energy, these excited states are no longer bound states. That's why now I no longer put these numbers like in the previous slides. I just show these dashed lines. They have moved onto the continuum. What happens to them? They appear as resonances. So you can imagine this is some kind of a resonance of a very low energy neutron on the 19 carbon. This is a resonance structure. This was also done for the first time because before that, the whole community in this FEMO physics always believed that in the three body system, if you increase the strength of the binary subsystems, then this bound FEMO states will eventually become virtual states. But actually this is very interesting. They're showing up as resonances, which is a physical reality. So you can actually see them and experiments. And we used all diagnostics to check that they are indeed resonances. I'm not going to the details. And uh, what interesting thing that you'll see that on these resonances, I have put this symmetric bright with kind of these structures. They're not fitting it. These are all theoretical calculations, but my calculated resonances have a very peculiar asymmetric shape here, here, right? What is the physics of it? Is it some artifact of the calculations that we see that there is a sure short resonance, the cross-section shoots up at a certain value of the incoming neutron energy, and then forget about it. But you cannot ignore this very peculiar shape. And this is where I invite the third character in this talk, Professor Ugo Fano. Now we are talking of resonances, and this res that is established, that this is the resonance. FM of effect has evolved into resonance. But the resonance also has this kind of very peculiar shape. Why is it so? And this was actually addressed long back uh, by Professor Ugo Fano. Uh, he 
was studying resonances and he said that the most general shape of a resonance is asymmetric because when resonance happens when you study the scattering cross sections uh, with energy then for a given energy uh, uh, you see the resonance it shoots up when the incoming energy of the projectile crosses the energy of an discrete state embedded in the continuum okay so that means the final state can be arrived at by going through two pathways one directly connecting to the continuum or another through this discrete state which is embedded into the continuum and that means there are two pathways and two amplitudes so quantum mechanics when you have two amplitudes they will interfere constructively or destructively and giving rise to this kind of an asymmetric shape of a resonance and now that means that the resonance will be uh, characterized by not just the centroid energy and the width but also another resonance or the fano index q okay which is basically the ratio of these two amplitudes one going to the embedded state a discrete state embedded in the continuum and another and the denominator is that that pathway when you directly couple to the continuum in normally nuclear physics the 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 discrete embedded state is very uh, dominant and so you are this num the q is very large and you actually see a symmetric this whole whole shape actually becomes symmetric however interesting thing is that in lithium 11 which is not a normal nucleus like 16 oxygen it has a very very pronounced uh, this uh, matter distribution and large spatial extension and it is very weakly bound so these efimov states if they are there in this nuclei will have a lot of overlap with the continuum and that means these two pathways these two amplitudes will compete very favorably and so therefore it will give you an asymmetric shape and this was our interpretation we understood this and we then connected now this fano resonance is known to all atomic molecular physicists even condensed matter physicists but it is hardly known in the nuclear physics community or or in the high energy physics community so we actually found that this was our calculated a resonance shape and we found that this is the one can actually put the fano uh, profile on it and we understood the underlying physics so we connected we look at the efimov effect we find some signature of efimov states under certain conditions in a nucleus like 20 carbon then we see how these efimov states evolve to become resonances above the two body breakup threshold and then another interesting thing because of this very peculiar shape of this hello nucleus we see that this resonance has an asymmetric fano resonance so when this was realized one of us authors actually gave his own rendition to a very famous haiku of uh, basho and an ancient pond a frog jumps in a deep resonance so now we we can see that so you can see all these states which are efimov bound states going to the continuum and disappearing and or coming up as resonances and uh, so in order to this is exactly the picture that is this is the ground state of the nucleus and then this is some excited state efimov state this is the two body threshold and you just go above it okay and you show up at resonances and this is the three body threshold so maybe i will just try to uh, end up now because it is one hour is over so i'll just tell you that we established this thing and uh, uh, and then we try to generalize the whole thing that is it something you see just in one nucleus like 20 carbon actually that is not so so i will jump uh, skip this slide and i will say we carried out these calculations of course you have to do realistic calculations you cannot do for any nucleus you have to really do for nucleus which are supposed to be two neutron hello so two other realistic cases are 38 magnesium and 32 neon and also they are non boromian because we have now established that in boromian system it is least likely to show fm of states so 38 magnesium is one nucleus which you can imagine as 36 magnesium plus 2 neutron and we also have 32 neon which you can imagine as 30 neon plus 2 new, new, neutrons and in that 31 neon is bound 37 magnesium is also bound so it satisfy all our criteria and same then we do these calculations and uh, we show that we get the ground state energies then we see the excited state energies and then beyond a certain value of the two body interaction strain the excited standard state energies disappear and then they reappear as resonances interesting thing is that we had done these calculations for like 38 magnesium and 32 neon and also a hypothetical nucleus where the core is very large let us say 
102, a nucleus 102, which we have core is 100 and two neutrons. And that also shows exactly the same feature. However, if you go to three equal mass cases, there probably we see virtual states instead of these resonances, okay? So that more or less establishes or completes the whole story. And so I can tell you that uh, one can look for such things in radioactive ion beam facilities. And these discussions are going on for long to do this kind of measurements. 20 carbon by now is now well established that the most uh, favorable nucleus to look for 20 carbon uh, FM of states in, in, in atomic nuclei. So, so now I will just like to summarize. And the summary is this, I talked about, I introduced you to this uh, amazing world of hello nuclei. I primarily talked about two neutron hello nuclei. And uh, then I also told you that there are different theoretical prescriptions. One I talked about is uh, three body for the kind of calculations. I hardly went into any detail of it, but I told you some, some uh, gross picture. And I showed by using this three body calculations, we can address the structural properties of uh, nucleus like lithium 11, 14 beryllium, 12 beryllium, 20 carbon, 22 carbon, like all these nuclei. And we can calculate its structural properties like binding energies, momentum distributions, uh, beta decay, etc. And then we can use these nucleus as uh, very important laboratories to search for FEM of states. And we again showed first time that non-boromian nucleus like 20 carbon is the best bet to search for FEM of states. And we found theoretically, of course, the signature of FEM of states in such nucleus. And then we also went further and showed how this FMO, which are bound state below two body breakup threshold, evolves into resonances above the two ball breakup threshold. And then because of the underlying funnel mechanism, they show up as asymmetric resonances. This is important because experimentally, if you see a resonance and see the profile as asymmetric, then that is a telltale signature of a FMO state evolving into a, into a resonance. So that brings me to the end of the talk. I understand I crossed my one hour. So I want to sign up here with only this uh, quotation from Dennis Wilkinson, who said that the richness of understanding reveals even greater richness of ignorance and that as researchers, we realize it every day. So there is uh, no ending to the story. It is just the beginning. And uh, let me sign off and I thank you all for your patience. Thank you, sir, for a wonderful presentation. I think uh, the student have enjoyed uh, this session. And if you allow me, then uh, we can uh, start our discussion session. Sure, sure, sure. Sir, so uh, anybody can uh, join with us. Uh, so we have some question from inbox. So uh, we know uh, six, seven lithium is important for astrophysics. So why it is uh, important? So some, some of student actually asks. Yeah, well, oh, that's yes. actually a very, very, very interesting question. I like it, though it is not directly connected to this talk. So yeah, you yeah, know, no, no, this is very interesting. I pro you probably have this is in mind. I, I'm trying to tell you that uh, nuclear physics. One of the most important things of nuclear physics is this case is the nuclear astrophysics, that's the nucleosynthesis. Yeah. That yeah. is, I showed you the first Sigri chart. We have all yeah. kind of nuclides are there. So it is the job of the nuclear physicists to explain that why these nuclei are there. For example, if you actually plot what is called the abundance plot, then what is the most abundant? Proton, abundance right? Plot, yeah. And you keep, yes, then it goes down the abundance chart. So we had Big Bang creation many, many years ago. Mm -hmm. And today we see in the universe, I have this much proton, deuteron, tritium, oxygen, and all isotopes, etc. We have to explain that number. And so now we divide these different time or epochs this, this, this nucleosynthesis. One epoch is the Big Bang nucleosynthesis or something which is happening within the first one minute or so. And when, I actually have some plot I can show that you are producing, you are there proton, neutron, triton, uh, helium-3, helium-4, lithium, six lithium, seven lithium, and that's it, like that. And then all these are produced and some millions of years, then these clouds are formed, then the stars are forming and inside the star, you, have, you know all these processes, proton burning, you know, helium yeah. burning, yeah. those things are happening. But the lithium is interesting because in the Big Bang thing, if you look at the abundance of six lithium and seven lithium, that is not understood. So I think that is one of the very interesting things. So 
inf information has to come from nuclear physicists. We have to produce those reactions. Okay, you know, proton, proton giving deuteron, proton, deuteron gives helium-3. Okay, and then helium-3, helium-3 alpha particles and two neutrons. Okay, and so and eventually you also get six lithium, seven lithium like that. So, but what the, the, the ratios are not exactly understood. What is called the lithium puzzle. So that is why from cosmology point of view, astrophysics lithium is very interesting. Because it's not understood in the Big Bang, what is the ratio of six and seven lithium? Yeah. Thank you, sir. So yeah. another question asked by one more student. So uh, uh, we have uh, so you have already discussed about the if you more effect. So what is the ultra cold quantum matter? Uh, so it's maybe related with this. So oh, that is, a, that is the oh, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. So this is actually an atomic physics. This is my favorite research, but it is called the cold atom physics, where where you are actually you are pulling okay. a system. You know, you are pulling a system by creating an optical molasses by lasers. I mean, you there are various techniques because when you have an you have a gas, let us say in a, in a container, you have a gas, mm. and uh, let us say there are all the cesium or potassium like that. And you try to cool it. And normally, you know how to what do you do by cooling. And I'll keep the whole enclosure in some cold uh, environment. Heat. I want to take out the heat. But how much you can cool? We are really going down to nano kelvin or micro kelvins like that. So there are special techniques. So when you do it, the eventually the whole ensemble, or when you even go to Bose Einstein condensates, the whole system collapses. Like you know, the whole system is like one single unit. Okay. So then it's very cold. So this whole physics is that of the cold atom. So in, in that cold system, some of people saw the signature of FMO effect. Experimental nuclear physics has not yet been seen. So thank you, sir. So we have another question. So uh, we know that the three-body uh, model, actually, uh, for two neutron halonuclei. So can a yes. uh, three-body model used for one neutron halonuclei? Is it? Uh, of, of course not, uh, because you know one neutron is like eleven beryllium. You have just two-body system now, so you can okay. exactly uh, exactly oh, use okay. a three-body model for it. Or for that matter, if I say, let us say, I take uh, 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 like eight helium, which I said as a neutron skin, but you can also argue it is in a compact alpha particle and four uh, neutrons. So it's a five body model. So, you know, so the complexities increase. When we say three body model, we are talking about so called Fadev kind of equations. If you go to a four body system, then you will talk of what is called Yakubovsky's equations and things like that. So, obviously, for 11 beryllium, I will not use a three body model because it is not a three body system at all. Okay. So, another question. Though you have already uh, talked about the neutron skin, actually, he asks uh, to explain it again. What is neutron skin? No, no, that is very, very nice. Uh, that is, uh, you know, uh, this skin means you just think about uh, oxygen uh, 16, eight protons, eight neutrons. Okay. A compact laddu, yeah. protons and neutrons and all like this. And uh, you cannot imagine really protons, neutrons are equal number. So, but okay. if you keep increasing more and more neutrons, right? So if you have, let us say, lithium-11, sure. I can even nine lithium core, but two neutrons. This is like a halo. Halo means, as I was showing these pictures, uh, let me just go, that will be very useful if you show this. Yes. Yeah. Can you see it? So yeah, this is what I'm showing the profile of the matter distribution or the density distribution for any stable nucleus like this. You can imagine like a sharp cutoff, a, a, a hard sphere. That is, this is the the density is more or less constant, starting from the center of the sphere and then falls. But if you have like a halo, the two neutrons or one neutron, they tend to move out more and more. More than 50% of the time, the probability is outside the range of the interaction. A very dilute, but a halo, you know, going on and on with functions. But as the skin is not that dilute, but it goes beyond. So more and more neutrons you are putting, 
almost like a skin of neutrons outside that compact core which have both protons and neutrons but on top of it you have a layer of neutrons you can imagine that way and then the profiles will be like this and this experimental picture shows exactly the same thing in case of uh, lithium 11 this is the wave functions for the neutrons the valence neutrons very dilute but just goes on and on whereas compared to that in the skin that falls i hope i i, I explain it yeah yeah okay thank you sir so there is one more question from our student so yes. uh, he actually want to know uh, the application of ifimov effect and another question is it possible to create a device of neutron source by using ifimov effect First well, application application by if you mean a real application like uh, you say using nuclear energy we produce power and all that i am not talking about that application but it has it first of all it's a very very cute beautiful quantum pure quantum mechanical effect so that yeah. is fine we accept that application it can have a very important application in nuclear astrophysics you know sometimes uh, if because of this if presence of the efimov state a three body nucleus can be stable and eventually one can connect that why that star was shining brighter and eventually can be brought down to that so no such thing has hap happened so far but i'm saying it has its own application like i showed the whole sigri chart and as you go to the neutron rich uh, drip side and uh, we hardly know anything about those nuclei and that is where uh, this uh, application of afm of states actually do come let me give one example for example for example the thing that first came to the mind of this, the nuclear physicist very early if you talk of carbon 12 a good old nucleus we all know about it but if you excite it and put 7.65 mev state then that state is called the hoyle state which is basically not not a compact ladoo of uh, protons and neutrons it is not a nucleus very compact it is basically three separate separate alpha particles almost like a triangle and that state is called the hoyle state and it is because of that state we all exist now many times people felt that maybe is that a of state i can tell you with a bit of conviction that that is not an of state but when you see such a thing you immediately see is it an of state so you can have such a form of state in some nucleus in certain case, which may have far reaching ramifications, but no practical application as of now. Yes, I mean, that I cannot think of. As of now, okay. Thank you, sir. So, so there is yes. another question, uh, maybe the last question. So you have mentioned about okay. the Bose-Einstein quantum state. So is there any relation yes. between this uh, Bose-Einstein quantum state with the uh, form effect, or well? No, 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 no. The, yes, the, the relation is not. No, no. The the ifim of state both ions and condensate. Try to understand it. I am cooling it. All the particles kind of collapsing and making the B condensate. But the connection is this: if I start with let us say uh, one lakh atoms, we are all separate, and I am cooling them, okay. and I am making the condensate. When it is formed, you actually see it no longer contains that one lakh particles or atoms, many of which have actually moved out of the system. All the, all the system has got depleted. Why? Because this is a many body system, but you have few body systems. When you are cooling, two atoms may form a dimer momentarily. And then by a flashback resonance, another atom may come and form a timer. If there is an FM of state, these three particles will try to be in that FM of state. And now you can imagine, this is clusterization. Right, you have 1,000 students on the ground, and your phys physical education teacher comes and says, "Let us form a nice ensemble, a matrix, square matrix, in, in, in lines, stand in lines." But some people decide that they are friendly. Two or two, two people together, they move out of the system. Then three persons make a group, and they move out of the system. What is left is a certain n number of uh, ensemble of n number of particles but it has been depleted because clusterization took place. And this clusterization for three atoms is taking place because there is an FMOF state. So as such, to study a Bose-Einstein condensation, you do not need to know about FMOF effect. But experimentally to produce FMOF states in atomic physics, 
you need a bose einstein condenser as you cool during that process a clusterization happens a trimer is formed it goes out of the system why because it struck an fmo state in the three body system that is the connection so, any more thank you sir no th thank you sir okay. i think uh, we have uh, completed our uh, question session and uh, there is no more question so if you allow me so we can uh, uh, end the discussion session now yes 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 thank you thank you very much okay. and uh, uh, thank you sir i, I am sorry it got delayed because uh, all of a sudden i mean i had no connection with tf <laughs> so i don't know why so yeah i'm happy that we could manage it so i'd like to thank you again on the behalf of the department of physics from the university of science and technology and it's a very uh, great day for us because uh, the physicists like you uh, directly connect with us and our students uh, can uh, learn lots of things from you and uh, hopefully you will uh, uh, give us another day uh, for our student and uh, at, at the end could you say something for our student and for the uh, a new generation researcher how they prepare themselves well i do not know i mean who are the students i am addressing if you are already doing phd so no problem if you are already doing nuclear physics so probably you find it uh, i was kept it at a very elementary level but uh, uh, if you have questions about it you can always uh, write to me i mean professor das has my email addresses so if you want to discuss about it i mean uh, one can always discuss about it i mean uh, because some of you may be nuclear physicists are interested in nuclear physics some may not be so uh, if you have any question related to this just write to me and i will definitely get back to you with my answer so uh, the, 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 there is another question come recently so yeah, okay the sure we are asking is is there any opportunity for a master student to uh, find any position in tfr E, yes uh, i am sure we have uh, scope for uh, foreign students so i do not think of people from bangladesh as foreigners to us but uh, technically it is so so i think that is there but we have uh, written examinations at the end of uh, uh, the year in around december so uh, okay. we have our website all the informations are there so foreign students are are allowed it is okay. not that they are not allowed but, uh, Yes, that is always possible. Yes, sir. So uh, thank you, sir. Uh, so yeah. it's, a, it's, a, it's a pleasure for us. Uh, we have had such a uh, good webinar with you, and uh, thanks again for giving us uh, time to arranging uh, to arrange uh, such a uh, webinar with you. So uh, thanks again and uh, good night. Uh, good night. Today. Good night. Bye. Good night. Bye bye. Good night. Sir. Hopefully, we will see you again. Thank you.